before I get going, I would actually just like to say thank you, Natasha, for allowing me to be here. It's already proven to be so wonderful, even just listening to, to Meg and, and everybody else has just been so wonderful. So I am very excited to be here. Let's see. All right. So I would like to begin by warning you all that this talk may be a little unconventional in its approach, primarily because I am going to present an argument that first off is still very much a work in progress. And second off, because it builds off some work that I've done elsewhere. And I have to admit that I am well aware of the perils and pitfalls that come with that approach. But the fact of it is that I just really need your help answering this one specific question. And that is, why did Herodotus portray Focus and Macedon so positively in the Platea narrative? I'm fairly certain that this portrayal of these two nations is significant in some way, especially considering Athens' similarly positive portrayal in the same narrative and how harshly Herodotus treats everybody else. But the mechanic as to why the narrative survives in the histories like this, I have a theory, I'll get to that by the end, but I just wanted to note at the outset that I will welcome any alternative explanations for this observation. And I expect and even hope for some challenges to my argument that might shed a little light on whatever it is that's going on here. Now, as to the work that I plan to use as a jumping off point, its relevant conclusion isn't hard to summarize. Simply, I argued that Herodotus's portrayal of Athens in the Plataea narrative, which I defined on the single criterion of narrative cohesion from Mardonius's invasion to the conclusion of the action at Plataea, that in those chapters from 8.133 to 9.70, Athens' portrayal is almost hyperbolically positive, especially in contrast with Herodotus's less favorable treatments of the other Greek states in the same narrative. Hopefully you can see immediately why that argument is relevant here. Essentially, the bigger question that I will try to answer today is why does Herodotus portray Focus and Macedon and Athens so positively in this narrative? But to prove the latter point over again would take more time than I have today. And several of you saw that talk at SES anyway. So while I'd like to imagine that you are all both familiar and thoroughly convinced by my previous argument for now, I'm just going to ask you to accept my earlier conclusion that Athens is surprisingly well treated by Herodotus in the Plataea narrative, especially considering how harshly he treats Sparta and the other Greeks, but not all the other Greeks, because it's not just Athens that receives a generous treatment from Herodotus. As I've implied already, two other states share Athens' place in this narrative as conspicuous champions of Hellenic values and heroism, and that's Phocus and Macedon. But wait, you might be thinking, didn't Focus and Macedon fight the bad guy, fight with the bad guys at Plataea? Why would Herodotus be so keen on rescuing the reputation of a couple of Medizers while undermining the generally acclaimed hero of Plataea, by which, of course, I mean Pausanias and the Spartans? And Herodotus's choice to privilege these particular states, uh, these particular Medizers, is odd for other reasons too. And I'll get to that in a second. But first, let's dive into the evidence and I will show you what I mean by a positive portrayal of Phocus and Macedon. Now, to be clear from the start, both Phocus and Macedon are still minor players in the narrative. The former only shows up twice, the latter features a little more centrally, but is still pretty peripheral. And I should also probably say that I am well aware of the arguments of Ernst Badian and others who have read subtle criticisms of Macedon into some of these passages. We'll get to that in due course as well, but for now I'll just say that I stand with a number of recent scholars who have preferred to take Herodotus's presentation of Alexander more or less at face value as a proud but vulnerable monarch trapped in the treacherous liminal space between East and West. So all I'm trying to show right now then is that on the surface level at least, Herodotus goes out of his way to emphasize that both cases of Medism, both Phocus and Macedon, were not only forced into Persian service against their will, but also they stayed remarkably loyal to the Hellenic cause throughout, even in the face of considerable pressure. In other words, Herodotus wants us to believe, or at least to get the impression that both Phocus and Macedon were in fact doing their best to uphold Greek values while navigating a bad situation with almost, that was almost entirely out of their control. The Phocian contingent's remarkable initial rendezvous with the Persian army provides a great jumping off point for what I mean. 
Beginning at 917, this is handout 1A, practically every sentence that Herodotus writes either emphasizes Phokian resistance to joining the Persian forces, or it celebrates the valor of the Phokians, or it celebrates the Phokians' devotion to Greece and their own Greekness, even in the face of overwhelming Persian strength. After singling out the Phokians for medizing under duress rather than voluntarily, Herodotus goes on to narrate what amounts to an actual battle between the Phokians who are attempting to join the Persian formation and the Persians themselves, who Herodotus implies suspect the Phokians of sympathizing with the Greeks. And even though the two sides don't end up actually engaging, uh, Herodotus, well, they engage a little bit, but not. Herodotus takes this real circumstance as an opportunity to include a stirring harangue delivered by Harmasides, the Phokian. This is handout 1b, following, of course, Tom Holland's recent translation. It is clear enough, Phokians, that we are staring at annihilation. These men have come to deal us our deaths, prompted, I imagine, by the slanders of the Thessalians. Every last man among you, then, needs now to prove himself a true man, better, after all, to meet the end of our allotted spans in action, fighting in our own defense, than tamely to hand ourselves over to be slaughtered, a shameful fate indeed. And then he ends his speech saying, no, we need to teach each one of them what it means to be barbarians and to conspire to the murder of men who are Greeks, thus explicitly situating the Phokians on the Greek side, despite being in the act of joining the Persian army, while also making it clear that the Phokians have no sympathy for the Persian barbarians for whom they will end up fighting. And even more remarkably, this battle ends, and this is handout 1C, not because the Phokians surrender or because they're defeated or in any way prove their loyalty to the Persian cause, but rather because the Persians are just so impressed with Phokian valor that they decide it would be better to try and convert them with favors after the battle rather than face their resolute resistance before the battle, which means that the Phokians get to join the Persian army after all, or is it that they have to join the Persian army? Either way, Herodotus makes it clear where Phokian sympathies lie. Herodotus underscores this characterization of the Phokians later in the narrative when he insists that many of the Phokians in fact refused to fight for the Persians, but rather waged a significant guerrilla resistance against them from the foothills of Mount Parnassus. And this is handout D. Herodotus thus exhibits a consistent intention to portray the Phokians as, as close to not medizing as actual historical Medizers possibly could be, and then taking care to celebrate the Phokians' valor and dedication to Greece along the way. Aside from Athens and Phocus, Herodotus's Plataea narrative includes one other conspicuously positive portrayal of a Greek state, and that's Macedon. Looking past the fact that Herodotus begins the Plataea narrative with the defense of Alexander I's descent from Heracles, I'd like to skip ahead to a speech delivered by Alexander himself on the eve of the battle, because this speech is remarkably similar to the one just given by Harmasides, not only in its occasion and its historical implausibility, but also in its apologetic motivations, its commitment to Greek values, and its pitched emotional rhetoric as well. The night before the Persians, unbeknownst to the Greeks, are preparing to attack Alexander risks everything to inform the Greeks of Mardonius's plan, but his speech goes far beyond simply sharing intelligence. Alexander takes the opportunity, just as Harmasides did a few chapters earlier, to emphasize his commitment to the Greek cause, his helplessness in the face of Persian strength, and his persistent loyalty to Hellenic ideals as an antithesis of the Persian, whom, like Harmasides, he calls barbarians. And here we move on to handout 2A. Alexander, <clears throat> sorry, Alexander concludes his speech saying, please, if the war does end as you are trusting that it will, you must bear me and my own freedom in mind as well. This risky venture which I have undertaken, I have done it for you. It is because I am such an enthusiast for the Greek cause that I wished to alert you to Mardonius's intentions and to prevent the barbarians from sweeping down on you unawares. I am Alexander of Macedon. The character which Herodotus paints here is of an enthusiastic and conflicted monarch who, despite his deep ties to Greece, both ideological and genealogical, is making the best of a bad situation, doing what it takes to survive. 
The sympathetic portrayal echoes Herodotus's treatment of Alexander at the beginning of the Plataea narrative, when Mardonius chooses Alexander as an envoy to the Athenians to convince them to join the Persian side, which must have been an awkward situation for Alexander because he is chosen for this role precisely because he has always been a quote, representative and benefactor, proxenos kai eurbites of the Athenian people, this is handout to be. And so, presumably, Alexander knows just how poorly Macedo Mardonius's uh, message will be received, which is why when he arrives in Athens, Alexander explains his presence and his distasteful message by attributing his words directly to Mardonius, who in turn is attributing them to Xerxes, and he also attributes them to compulsion, of course, and that's handout to C. But when he speaks for himself, he speaks warmly and of his goodwill ostensibly. It is only his concern for a dear ally's well-being that prompts him to advise Athens to collaborate with Persia. And indeed the Spartans, whose embassy is present solely to prevent Athens from being persuaded by Alexander's concern, the Spartans recognize the validity of Alexander's excuse even if with a barb at Alexander calling him a tyrant. That's handout 2D. And the Athenians, on the other hand, dismiss Alexander kindly, reconfirming his status as proxenos and in the process, handout 2E. So despite Ernst Badian's argument that Herodotus meant this whole exchange to subtly tarnish um, Alexander's reputation, I align myself rather with a number of more recent scholars who see Herodotus's portrayal of Alexander here, to quote a recent article by, by Yoan Maloney, as, quote, a nuanced and non-judgmental representation of the reality of the Macedonian situation. The fact that Alexander Medized is entirely unsurprising. It's Athens' refusal to Medize, even in the face of these benevolent and compelling arguments, that merits this story's distinction as a Thoma. Indeed, Herodotus's portrayal of Alexander here prompts us to take a step back and look at how Herodotus might have handled Phocus and Macedon's Medism. And we have several excellent examples of the alternative in this very same narrative, by which, of course, I mean Herodotus's treatment of other Medizers. Thebes and the rest of Boeotia, for example, are given the opposite treatment from Phocus and Macedon. They are repeatedly denounced for their overeager and inexcusable Medism. Herodotus says of the Thebans at 940, handout 3a, that medizing wholeheartedly, they were carrying on the war eagerly. He further records a solicitous Theban argument, or sorry, an aristocrat, inviting the Persians to a banquet where Herodotus describe, describes the intimate familiarity between the two peoples, saying, handout 3b, rather than being kept apart, the Thebans and the Persians were instead placed together, one Theban and one Persian on every couch. On several occasions, the Thebans gratuitously advised the Persians, showing their eagerness to help the invaders' cause. That's handouts 3, C, D, and E. And they offer good advice at that. In two of these instances, 9.2 and 9.41, their advice not to engage the Greek forces and to try to subvert the Greek nations with wealth is ignored to the immediate detriment of the Persians, you know, losing the battle and stuff. In the third instance, 938, Mardonius actually takes their advice and the result is disaster for the Greeks. Nor did the Thebans lose their resolve when at last face to face with the Greek enemy in the final battle while the sympathetic Macedonians attack only half-heartedly before breaking away. The Thebans and Boeotians, quote, fought eagerly and they did not conscientiously retreat such that 300 of their first and finest troops fell to the Athenians, handout 3F. Herodotus is so concerned with maintaining this image of the Boeotians as Medizers that when Mardonius cuts down some Boeotian trees for his palisade, handout 3G, Herodotus actually emphasizes that Mardonius is not acting out of any hostility toward the Boeotians and the Thebans, but rather just to satisfy his need for lumber, an act which stands in stark contrast with the immediately preceding destruction in Athens where Mardonius duly put Athens to the torch, pulling down any stretch of city wall, house, or shrine that had been left standing until all was rubble. And it's not just the Thebans who Herodotus criticizes for going over to the Persians. Herodotus also calls out the Thessalians, is saying for A, that the Thessalian leaders, far from regretting their earlier actions, only cheered on the Persian the more, so much so indeed that Thorax of Larissa, who had already accompanied 
Xerxes on his retreat, had no hesitation at all now about encouraging Mardonius to attack Greece. And Herodotus treats the Argives marking them as conscientiously ingratiating themselves toward the Persians without any restraint, dispatching, and this is handout 4B, the fastest long distance runner they could find as a herald to Mardonius to warn him of Spartans approach. Through the whole of the Plataea narrative then, Herodotus portrays every other Medizer aside from the Phocians and the Macedonians as deliberate and eager enemies of Greece. But what about the Greeks who actually did fight for the Greeks? I mean, Already, I, I mentioned how uncharitably Herodotus treats Sparta. I'll be happy to go into that a little bit more after the talk if people are curious, but I, yeah. But the main question is, what about everybody else? And it may not shock you to learn at this point that he's really pretty uncharitable toward all the other Greeks that fought for the Greeks too, although they are decidedly less prominent than Sparta in this narrative. In fact, most of the Greeks who fought against the Persians are so absent from the Plataea narrative that Plutarch accuses Herodotus of malice on their account. The malice of Herodotus, creatively titled. Prior to the very end of the battle, Herodotus only mentions the majority of the Greeks, calling them just that, hoi polloi, when they disobey orders during a fearful retreat. And this is handout 5a. The hour agreed for departure came, and the bulk of the army, hoi polloi, getting to their feet, set off. But this was not, however, with any intention of making for the prearranged location, since once they were on the move, all they really wanted to do was escape the cavalry by heading to the city of Plataea. And once they had reached there, they dumped all their gear down in front of the shrine of Hera. In other words, these Greeks' most notable achievement in all the action at Plataea is simply to disobey orders because they're afraid of the Persians. And then we hear nothing of any other Greek ally until the Corinthians and Megarians find out that the Persians are retreating, whereupon they haphazardly march back into the action just in time to loot the Persian camp. That's handout 5b. And even then, the Megarians are slaughtered by the Thebans as a result of their disorderly march. In the end, the only Greek state to fight against the Persians at Plataea and receive any real unqualified praise for it is Athens. Herodotus depicts every other Greek ally as fearful, incompetent, and self-interested. So at last, we come to the question that I set out to answer. Why does Herodotus single out these three Greek states, Athens, Phocus, and Macedon, for such positive treatment while leaving every other Greek state, including Thebes, Thessaly, Corinth, and even Sparta, with markedly unimpressive and sometimes even downright, downright critical portrayals. And this is a particularly astounding group because these three states, Athens, Focus, and Macedon, share practically nothing in common, at least not on the surface. So let me show you what I mean. Um, Focus and Macedon, both Medizers, Athens definitely not. Geographically speaking, Focus and Athens are mainland territories. Macedon is on the periphery of the Greek world. Ethnographically, Phocus is Doric, and so is Macedon, or at least Alexander is, as the genealogical myth at the beginning of the Platean narrative makes clear. But Athens is very Ionian, and so the explanation can't be ethnographic. As far as government goes, where Macedon is a monarchy with an emphasis on its aristocrats, Phocus was more of a regional confederacy, at least it had archons and stuff. And Athens was obviously a democracy. As far as having a powerful contingent of aristocrats, though, whose enmity Herodotus might wish to avoid, Athens and Macedon certainly have their fair share, but references to Phocian aristocrats are few and far between. What about the significant power influence that Thessaly and Thebes' elites wield? And then there's the possibility that Herodotus just likes these three states more than the rest, which is somewhat plausible except that he at least acknowledges these states' shortcomings elsewhere in the history. This is 8.30 in the middle of the Salamis episode, uh, 7.171 at Tempe, and 7.139, where he's, that famous passage where he says, eh, it's probably not a very popular thing to be in favor of Athens, too obviously. So he acknowledges these shortcomings elsewhere in the histories, and he defends and even praises most of the other Greek states who are belittled here. So in the face of all this confusion, I would like to suggest that we might be able to better understand the side grouping 
by revisiting the second conclusion that I reached in the paper, to which I referred earlier, the one about Athens. And this conclusion is one that I am more than willing, even eager to discuss in the context of this argument. In short, I proposed that since Herodotus seems to be playing by consistent rules in this narrative that appear to contradict his explicit strategies elsewhere in the histories, that there must have been some outside influence on Herodotus' uh, telling of the Patean narrative that doesn't apply to the rest of the histories, but that that influence can't simply be explained by Herodotus' sources, which others, have argued, which others have argued represent a wide variety of Greek nations. It's kind of all over the place, very much not consistent. So rather, I suggested that we ought to attribute that influence to Herodotus's audience. And since my focus was on Athens, I proposed an Athenian audience. Essentially, I argued that the history's pre-publication, appearance, and performances of Epidexis might have had a circular impact on Herodotus's production of these specific narratives, which would have left Athens narratively privileged not just because he's using their sources, and thus source criticism, but also because he expects Athenians to be in his audience, so audience criticism, as I called it. In other words, Herodotus would have performed this epidexis on the Battle of Plataea, either in public or in private, and afterward people would have come up to him and told him related stories that they know about the battle, about the characters, about whatever, at which point Herodotus would include any stories that he liked and that he thought would be well received in the next performance. So with this possibility in mind, might we also be able to understand Herodotus's portrayal of these other Greeks as a function of his performance context? Might we theorize that representatives from all three nations could have been prominent in Herodotus's anticipated audience? Well, the problem with that proposal is that Herodotus's grouped portrayal of Athens focus in Macedon here still makes no sense, at least not in the context of the history's traditionally accepted publication date. By the time uh, that Herodotus is publishing the histories as we know them, the Peloponnesian War is either in full bloom following the terminus post quem, or possibly it's nearing the Sicilian expedition following Fornara, or maybe even it's in its final stages following Elizabeth Irwin's recent argument. Whichever publication date you choose though, scholars have traditionally read the histories in the context of that war. And let me be clear here that I am not, I am not going to argue that that conclusion is wrong or even mis- I am convinced that the histories as a whole ought to be analyzed in that historical context. But if we apply the compositional context of the Peloponnesian War, an audience that includes not only Athens, but also Focus and Macedon still just doesn't make any sense. So yeah, Focus's ties at that point with Athens had been overthrown by Sparta in the mid 440s BCE and Macedon had been actively working against Athens since at least the mid 430s. And so it seems highly unlikely that Focus, Athens, and Macedon and no other Greek state that fought at Plataea would ever be in the same audience during the Peloponnesian War. But what if, as I proposed earlier, what if we consider the history's pre-publication as affecting the final draft? Is it possible that these early stages of composition, which according to lots of anecdotal evidence, at least, seem likely to have taken place in Athens in the mid fifth century, that these earlier stages of composition ended up forming the backbone of the narrative as it survives to us. In other words, what if we ask when might an audience of Athenians, Phocians, and Macedonians, and nobody else that would thought at Plataea have existed? So as I mentioned, these nations did, did fight on opposite sides for most of the Second Peloponnesian War, but if we go back to the mid fifth century, in the context of the First Peloponnesian War, the Phocians were actually allied with the Athenians, some of their closest allies, in fact, and believe it or not, so were the Macedonians. And given Phocus's geographical proximity to Athens, its wealthiest citizens could easily have made frequent visits to Athens. Why wouldn't they? Sounds awesome. And as far as Macedon goes, even though it's further away, Alexander I is one of the most celebrated proxenoi that Athens ever had as the Plataean narrative itself attests. And what's more, he was known in the mid fifth century to be a great patron of the arts. Pindar himself was supposed to have been commissioned by Alexander. And I am only one of many who have noted the striking similarities between Herodotus and Pindar elsewhere. So here we come to it. 
the only convincing explanation I can come up with for this grouping of positive portrayals in the Plataea narrative is not just that Herodotus was performing for Athenians, as my earlier paper concluded, but rather that those performances were taking place at the only time when there would also have been Phocians and Macedonians and no other significant contingent of Greeks who fought at Plataea in the audience. If that were the case, not only would Herodotus have been concerned to treat these nations favorably, he would also have heard stories from these same individuals after the performance, and those stories would have been full of anti-Spartan, anti-Theban, anti-Thessalian stories, which could in turn explain the nature and magnitude of the negative portrayals in Herodotus's narrative. So in the end, my guess is that those very narratives might have contributed greatly to the first phase of Herodotus's composition of the Plataea narrative. And to be clear, I would never argue that Herodotus couldn't have gained access to competing stories, either later on or even already in the mid fifth century. After all, he must at least have known about Simonides' Plataea elegy by the time that he was composing his own Plataea. But assuming that he did prepare the Plataea narrative for a specific performative audience, as I argued previously, Perhaps, as I am proposing now, perhaps he originally composed the narrative well before he completed the rest of the histories, at a time when Athens, Phocus, and Macedon were friends. And the influence of that original composition resulted in the bones, at least the bones of the surviving narrative being datable to the mid fifth century, even if the final product as we see it today can be dated to the later fifth century. So at least that's my worthy, working theory and yeah. I'll open it up to you all. Thank you. Thank you.